whatever it is that they need to overcome. And it was a little thing. I just need to get, I need to be better at spelling or whatever it might be. That whole mm-hmm. see me, however, about the spelling, that had such a profound promise, a little bit of capability mm-hmm. uh, and taking just a moment to help them overcome that. And, but I was more about development of people. I think it's simply the ability to say, I need help. I think people are afraid of looking foolish in front of a group of people. guest is my dear friend Michael Niles, a freelance trainer and public speaker, business advisor and digital marketing trainer specializing in supporting SME and startups in their digital journey. Welcome Michael. Hi Anita, it's lovely to be here. What is one of the most courageous things that you have done? Now I've known you for a number of years. I, I know most of your journey, I won't say I know it all, and we're great friends and I know you've done a lot of courageous things in your time but what is one of them? Probably the biggest thing for me because it was it it affected a a lot more than just myself was uh was the career change that I went through oh back in kind of 2008 when I uh I, I was doing corporate management and I'd I kind of completed my journey as far as corporate management was concerned I just didn't I wasn't engaged with it didn't enjoy it anymore and it was beginning to affect my health and my well-being to an extent so I made the decision to do a complete career change and become a a trainer Uh, as a journey that was about six years in the making and did uh, comprise about 12 months of unemployment which obviously had an impact on my family Mm -hmm. yeah I could have remained where I was but it wouldn't have done me any good so I decided to do that that complete left a job that I was in and spent that 12 months of unemployment working towards getting myself a role that was was training or coaching based. It was it was difficult and it was it was traumatic. And I say me not working for a year impacted mm. not just me but my family as well. So my wife was incredibly patient and very very supportive through that journey. And you know now I mean we're two thousand eight two thousand nine quite a few years later. Best decision I ever made impacted me financially for many many years. Um, mm-hmm. But the bottom line is that I have never been happier in myself. So uh, I think that was it because it was such a radical change of direction uh, in terms of yeah. what my CV looked like. I've always trained. I've always coached. It's something I've always had a passion for. But to actually take that and turn it into a profession was uh, a massive risk. Uh, and say I could just have sat on my, uh, on my laurels and carried on where I was. But uh, I don't think that would have been very good for anyone. So, uh, yeah, that was it. I, I made the decision, clean cut, left a role. Uh, and uh, yeah, spent 12 months volunteering to get some more experience and, mm-hmm. and then just really pushing myself out there and uh, contacting as many people as possible and learning as much as I could. And then thankfully, beginning of middle of 2010, uh, an organization, which is the organization that we met through, Fabulous Winter, they're the ones who took a bit of a risk uh, on me. And as my LinkedIn post said uh, a little while ago, it's... Uh, it was 12 years ago to the day, about two days ago, that I did my first business advice training course. And it was yes. fabulous. I uh, say, so haven't looked back, a life-changing experience for me, but very traumatic and very difficult for everyone. <laughs> and I think I've known you for those 12 years. It's been fantastic. And I myself can truly say, hand on heart, you are a fantastic trainer. Thank you. You're a fantastic person, full stop. <clears throat> and you're very understanding because, oh, starting up a business can be traumatic in itself let's just be honest <laughs> yes absolutely i mean I, i've been there for the last three and a half years again probably my second most courageous thing i ever did was to <laughs> was to step out of a nice salary after redundancy but rather than look for another job to to take the plunge into freelance and uh, yeah it's been a difficult three and a half years but i say very rewarding a very rewarding indeed i can imagine <laughs> So what inspired you to become a trainer? It's quite interesting because that's there's kind of two answers to that. I was recently, last year, one of the organizations I worked with did some video interviews of their trainers for their website for publicity. And they kind of, they asked that question. And there's a very quick answer to that. But on the train down to London, on, on the way to the, I, I was thinking about it. And there is kind of a, there's a secondary thing, which is not necessarily my inspiration to be a trainer, but why I think training where my mindset as far as training comes from. So mm-hmm. the, the simple answer about training is uh, towards the end of my managerial career, I knew I wanted a change. And actually I was heading towards HR 
because uh, I found that quite interesting, quite fascinated by HR. And yeah. I would work with the HR department and I had a couple of mentors to do that. And then I joined an organization in 2006 and I met this guy called Lane Burton. And Lane Burton okay. was the trainer for the organization I worked with. And Lane's training, star, Lane was a former professional dancer. Uh, he was in the Karma yeah. Chameleon video, the Boy George Karma Chameleon video. And he became oh. a trainer and he danced his training courses. You know, a five hour <laughs> long day course, he would not stand still. He was, you know, and it was everything. Now I'm a kinesthetic learner. I learned, and, and that was just, I was just enraptured by this guy. A lot of people were going, for goodness sake, Lane, just calm down. But I was just yes. like, this is wicked. Yeah, uh, and let's go. It, I know it was, it was just so exciting and it was, yeah. Whoa. And you know, I say that, that works for me. I could well imagine now knowing more about training and, and different <laughs> learning styles, why some people were just going, oh, please just sit down for a second. Yes. But it was him actually that, that inspired me. And I said, you know mm. what, I'd always trained and you know, I, I've been, I was, I've got qualifications in, in coaching fencing. And I, at the age of 14, I was training pond dipping courses for the Beds and Hunts Naturalist oh. Trust. And so it's always been a part of my life. I was a vocal coach for a young theatre group. Uh, so, but I'd never considered it to be a viable career choice for me. Uh, and then Lane mm. kind of made me go, do you know what, I want to do that. And, and that was the, the inspiration for me changing my career as far as, uh, as training was concerned. But the mm -hmm. kind of my mentality, and I think the reason that training, I've always, I've always invested in people. You know, when I was a manager, I was more about team. I wasn't very good at the paperwork side of things. It was always about the people and developing the people. Um, and that goes back I can to, agree. Um, I, I was not someone who enjoyed educational school in the slightest totally when, I was four, when I was 14 uh, and this is when would that be in 85 1985 I was at a school and there was the A and the B band for maths and English and I was in the A band for maths I was like second from top I think it was but for English I was quite close to the bottom I wasn't very good at English mm -hmm. I'm probably dysgraphic uh, you know so there was some things in, in there anyway and I'd always struggled mm -hmm. with English and didn't really enjoy it and one of the um, the teachers asked us to write a story and I love I love creative writing it's my favorite thing to do and I wrote yes. this story it was called Fallout Soldiers it was about it was a, a parody of of natural disaster films where a atomic bomb goes off in a rainforest and loads of ants mutate into killer ants and and there's this stupid scientist and his really intelligent sidekick who the obviously the sidekick sorts everything out and you know we win against the the, the ants and of I wrote course. this thing probably you know in the old exercise books that we used to get I was probably yes. eight or ten pages uh, and illustrated, Ooh. of course, because visual kinesthetic learner, I had to draw pictures as well. And I remember I got the book back, opened it up, and I had an A+. Plus. Never got an A+, plus before for English. But the teacher, Mr. O'Regan, if he's still out there, thank you, Mr. O'Regan, he basically puts, and it was a very simple sentence, and this is his only, only interaction. He said, excellent use of narrative, really good character development, great uh, story structure. See me, however, about the spelling. I went to see Mr. O'Regan and he said, you know, this is really good. You've got a talent for this. However, you know, there's, there's obviously something that we need to address. And he put mm -hmm. me on special spelling lessons, which meant I lost a lunch break a week, but you know, oh. I, and I would, I was learning spell. Now my spelling is still pretty atrocious, but I moved schools about six months later. I did the test to, to see which band of, of English I would get, go into. And I went mm -hmm. into the second from top. Oh, wow. And I actually took my English O level six months early and passed it. Oh, gosh. Now, Mr. O'Regan, you know, he was a good teacher and he said, but it was that see me, however, about the spelling, I think has always stuck with me because I would love to be the person who does that little thing that just helps that person. So, you know, I want to be yeah. the person that someone comes to and, and whatever it is mm. that they need to overcome. And it was a little thing. I just need to get, I would need to be better at spelling or whatever it might be. That mm -hmm. whole see me, however, about the spelling, that had such a profound impact on my life. That one simple, someone seeing a little bit of promise, a little bit of capability mm -hmm. uh, and taking just a moment to help them overcome that. And that's kind of, I think my mindset has always been since that day. That's why I've always coached and I've always trained um, yes. Even before I came full time and when I was, say, a manager, 
Um, I, I do put that in inverted commas, but I was more about development of people than necessarily development of the business, which is one of the reasons I left because organizations in the, in the early noughties were very much about the stick, not the carrot. I've always been a carrot person. And I think yeah. that is why training is so profound. And that is the thing that kind of, if I can just have that, that little thing, even if it's a small thing that allows someone to go off in a different direction and, and the success is always theirs because they have to put hard work in, they have to put the effort in. But if I'm the person who just gave them that little bit of extra information, that little bit of extra time, that little bit of extra confidence, I tell you, it's last week on Thursday, and this is going to sound awful actually, but last week on Thursday, I was at a seminar at the University okay. of Hertfordshire for um, one of the, the, I'm working on a, a grant scheme or have been working on a grant scheme in um, mm -hmm. Hertfordshire for businesses in the kind of film or TV industry. And I was at an event and I was talking to someone, I was networking with someone, uh, and this lad comes up to me, so, you know, mid-twenties, comes straight up mm -hmm. to me, and he said, really sorry for the guy I'm talking to, shook my hand vigorously, and he said to me, <laughs> four years ago, you told me to man up and sort my life out. And I went, "Wow!" and? And he said, here I am now, at a business event and stuff, and a big smile on his face. Now, there is no way I would ever have told someone to man up or sort their life out. <laughs> I can be very direct, but I would, certainly would have said, look, take this seriously. Either take it seriously or Gently. stop or something, whatever it might be. But that was a really lovely moment for me because I thought, yeah, that's four mm. years ago. And he remembered enough about me to come and say, and, you know, that four mm -hmm. years is all of his hard work and his effort and his success. None of that is my success. But if that just that one interaction was enough to make him go, OK, fine, and take the step he needed to step, that, that, is, that makes me feel... Uh, feel good so yeah uh, that's that's see me however about the spelling I think that might have been his see me about the spelling moment yeah and you are inspiring Michael thank you I know that firsthand that is a fantastic example of how you inspire others absolutely and you are just naturally you that's the great thing about it you know you see what you get and that's what I love about you mm. Michael yeah, there's, 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 there's absolutely, a, I, I can only be me, so I try to be yes. anything else. <laughs> so what took you on your journey of public speaking? Because let's face it, it ranks in the top five fears. I think it may even be number two with number one being flying. Yeah. So yeah. that's quite a big leap. I have always done it. That's the thing. Performance, uh, because I am a performer. Um, so I've been involved in amateur dramatics and musical theatre since I was very, very young which helps, yeah. you know, I am, I do yes. perform on my courses. I'm used to an audience and, you know, <laughs> I'm very comfortable in front of people. But when I was uh, 12, one of the teachers at my middle school, Mrs. Gallup, she, in our form time, would get us to do public speaking, oh, which they good. don't do anymore. And public speaking is such oh. a vital skill. It really is such an incredibly valuable skill. Now, even if it's just Definitely. speaking up in a meeting or, you know, whatever it might be, you know, you don't have to be in front of 400 people or anything like that. Uh, and she asked us to do the uh, public speaking. And the first time we mm -hmm. did, I kind of thought, oh, cool. Because, you know, well, I'm going to be in front of a load of people and they have to listen to me. I like that because I'm a massive show off. Bottom line is I'm a huge show off. <laughs> um, and I did uh, amphibians and reptiles of the British Isles for about 10 minutes because I was a complete, I'm a massive wow. science geek. Always was at school. <laughs> I never got picked first for the sports team, but I always got picked first for the science quiz. Excellent. But yeah, and uh, I remember her giving me 12 out of 10. Um, for my first bit of public speaking. And we did a couple of others, you know, we all had to have a go. And I think that's that's kind of where I've always done it. That That's mm -hmm. the thing. And I, it's just, it's like a comfy pair of slippers. It's very odd. I know I do public speaking courses and, you know, you get the people who are utterly terrified. I'm not, I'm never happier than when I'm standing up in uh -huh. front of a large group of people having a, having a chat. So, um, but it, it started for me, you know, at 12. And then something I always did through, I mean, generally that was carried through performance, but then in my, let's say my early twenties, I started running beginners courses for my local fencing clubs. So I'm a qualified fencing coach and I would, mm. I would run those. So again, from age 20, then my early thirties, I think it was, or mid thirties, I became the vocal coach for a young theater group. So again, being in front, and it was just something I always, I always did. And as I say, it wasn't until after seeing Lane, the dancing trainer, my brain kind of switched into this being a, uh, into a, a, a career, but no, I've always, yes. always enjoyed it. But one of the reasons for that is so ingrained from when I was very young, kind of eight or 12 was when I first really started uh -huh. getting up in front of people and, and talking. So now that's that's what it is. It's just something that is, you know, 
I'm 51 now. If I did it when I was eight, that's essentially 43 years of my life that I have been public speaking. And as a result, it's just wow. something that is, I wouldn't say effortless. Mm. It's never effortless, but it's something that, um, no. something I enjoy and something that I have a, a developed a, de a degree of skill in, I think. And that's the thing. It's a skill. And the more you do something, any skill can be learned. Public speaking is a skill. The more you do it, the better you get. It's like a muscle. The more you flex that skill, the bigger and stronger it gets. And I've just been flexing that muscle for a very, very long time. That's excellent. I really like your analogy there. And it is like anything else. The more you practice, it is a muscle, the better you get. Mm. You slightly touched on this. Your, I know you sing mm. and your theatre career. So t how did that all start? How did that come about? Um, it's just, I, I think it's another see me, however, about the spelling moment, to be honest with you. When I was eight, <laughs> uh, at my lower school, the, the head teacher, who's mm -hmm. sadly no longer with us, Mr. Selby, he was called, was, uh, was a, 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 a leading light in the amateur dramatics um, of Bedfordshire. He was a member of the Bedford Marionettes, and he, he did like it. And I remember it was about Christmas time. Uh, and I was there having my free school dinner and I was probably tucking into my chocolate toothpaste. Um, if you remember. <laughs> no, I meant it's a Bedford th Bedfordshire thing. Yeah. Oh, I love my chocolate toothpaste. And it was just before Christmas yeah. so they had Christmas carols going. Uh, I was singing along to Good King Wenceslas or whatever it might be. And I remember quite vividly, Mr. Selby kind of standing next to me and cocking his head to one side. And he kind of looked at me and he went, hmm. and he wandered off. And the following day in the full school assembly, he said, the other day I heard an absolutely lovely voice and I'd like to share that voice with you now. I'd love this person to come up and sing for you. And me and my mates were going, who's this boy? And he went, Michael Miles, <laughs> would you? And I was like, so I went up onto no. the stage and I sang something like All Things Bright and Beautiful. I got some applause and I must say, I kind of went, ooh, this is nice. I quite like this whole thing. He, he brought <laughs> yeah. me up three or four more times over the next couple of months. When he replaced me with someone else, I was very devastated and sad. Um, but my oh. dad was having singing lessons at the time. And uh -huh. um, I mentioned this to him that this has happened, and he said, "Oh, would you like to have, would you like to have singing lessons?" And I kind of went, "Yes," just to pre please my dad to begin with. And, okay, don't yeah. Uh, and I went along to the wonderful Patricia Laszlo again. Sadly, no longer with us. Pretty uh -huh. much from day one, I was like, "I ain't doing this for my dad. I'm doing this for me because there is such a, a freedom to it." And then I started doing plays at school. Then I joined the same amateur dramatic society as my dad when I was about fourteen. That has, you know, that has been my life. I continue to have singing lessons. I haven't done mm -hmm. any shows for a while because of the situation we've been in, but uh, I did yes. manage to get a, a singing competition in at the beginning of the year. And it's just, singing is, it's very liberating. Uh, if you've had a bad day, just singing is a great way because you have to breathe deeply, you, you're well oxygenated, you get adrenaline and endorphins and all of those kinds of things. Yes. Everybody should sing, in my opinion. Everyone can sing. Everyone can sing well, yes. but everyone can sing and everyone should sing because it's just brilliant for you. But yeah, it, it started all the way back at school again with just one person going, mm -hmm. hmm, you know, that, that's it. That has been my life, my passion. You know, everything, nothing outside of my family, there is nothing I love more. I mean, fencing, which was a sport yeah. I did, was something I really loved and I got quite good at. Okay. Although I'm recovering from a ruptured Achilles attendon because of that one. <laughs> but the singing and the acting and the performance has always been the thing that absolutely kind of, I wouldn't say it defines me, but certainly it is the, the one thing in my life I could not do without. It's just magical, mm -hmm. absolutely magical. And, you know, just music is something that unifies people. Uh, every single culture, every single person has music that they engage with, whatever it might be, whether it's Gregorian chants through to rock and roll or classical stuff like I want through to, you know, um, techno and house music everyone has some music that they want to switch on and listen to so it's it's just a, a fabulous thing and again my opinion something that should you know, drama music art should have far more uh, focus in education because they create so many incredible skills and build so much confidence for people so but i won't get on that particular orange box today <laughs> i totally agree with you and the thing is it is so rewarding for you mm. to inspire all these young people and with the clients you grow, that must give you some satisfaction, if not, you know, so much satisfaction about how you inspire people. And I know you do inspire people. So how, what kind of a feeling does that give you? How do you feel? About I love that? it. Uh, it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's why I do what I do, to be honest with mm -hmm. you, you know, you, um, you know, I'm, you know, 
I, I get paid to do it, obviously, you know, but uh, that's not the reason I could I could have stayed in management and got paid probably more than I'm getting right now if I'd stayed. Yes. And, and it hadn't driven me completely insane, which, to be honest with you, it was, it was <laughs> heading in that direction. So no, that is that that is the thing. It is my job to inspire people. You know, if you are a trainer or a coach or a public speaker, it is your job to get people leaving the time they spent with you energized and wanting to take whatever steps from then on. And when I do see people who have, uh, who are still in business, who are, are succeeding, who are, you know, it is, you know, and again, like I said, none of that is my success. You know, none of it's my success. I'm not so arrogant to think, oh yeah, I'm there, there because of me. Absolutely not. I might have given them some support. Less, I might yes. have given them a little bit of confidence, <laughs> but their success is their success. And and there are a number of businesses, yours, yours included, obviously, that I have tracked over the years, whether whether directly by talking to people, and engaging with them, or just by following them on a social network or, you know, sharing their mm -hmm. stuff whenever I see it. And it is incredibly gratifying to see them still going. And, you know, when people, when you do catch up with people on occasion like that, that situation, I don't remember that young man from last Thursday at all. I met him once <laughs> four years ago, I think when I was working at the university through winter, probably yes. um, giving some business advice and support. But yeah, it is, it's massively gratifying. When people actually come up and say, God, I hadn't, it's the, I mean, you're a trainer as well, um, you know, Anita, I'm sure yeah. you get this. It's the light bulb moments that you look for. It's that you're talking yes, about definitely. something and you just see someone, either they go, oh, wow, and it's obvious, or you just see them go, oh, and you're like, okay, yeah. Got you. Okay, mm. awesome. And it's it's the little bits because you know I'm I'm training mainly people who, you know, are very early in their journey. Or that you know, I mean, I do digital marketing, leadership, yes. public speaking. I think I'm uh -huh. quite a wide variety of things I train. And I generally get to people very early in their journey. So you know, it is that my view is always that everyone has the skills. It's just that you might need to point them in a slightly different direction. You know, that, that we can all do this. And that is kind of my mantra and what I try to get. And that's why you just suddenly see people going, oh, right, okay. And that that's what I'm always looking for. It's the little moments, it. it's not <laughs> the kind of hallelujah, oh my goodness kind of moments. It's just those little moments where you know that something's clicked and that person then go on Definitely. and that, that little bit that clicked is going to allow them to do something, you know, bigger or better or greater. Uh, I'm, I'm, my mantra is um, progression, not perfection. If you can start Absolutely. that kind of sense of progression where people can get better, every, a little bit better every single day, if you, can, if you can point them in the direction that allows them to do that, again, the spelling um, kind of analogy, yeah, that's incredibly rewarding because it's, you know, it's, it's the little things, lots of little things, generally the things that make the big things yes. happen. It's not big things that make the big things happen. It's lots of little things. So if I can help with a couple of the little things, that's, that makes me feel really good. And when I see that, and when I, when I do get to interact with people that you know have found what I do helpful or useful or inspiring or confidence building, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, that, that's why you do it. That's absolutely why you do it. Absolutely. And I can tell, and I know from personal experience, you are very passionate mm. about what you do. So that's absolutely excellent, Michael. What resources do you recommend daily tips or steps to anyone that wants to do public speaking? Because there is a lot of fear about it. Is there anything you would say? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to encapsulate into a, a small but, yes. but I'll start with my three P's. My three P's are preparation, practice and patience. So there's a quote from um, Arthur Ashe. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry I'm going to I'm going to get it up because I'm, I don't want to misquote it. Um, Arthur Ashe was a um, no, that's absolutely tennis funny. player uh, of the 1970s and 80s. And his thing, I'm just going to get a um, one important key to success is self-confidence. An important key to self-confidence is preparation. That's his quote. And the more prepared you are. So if you know, if you, you know, you know, your slides, you know, your information, you've, uh, you've, everything is organized beforehand. So you know exactly what your handouts are, you know, you, you know where the venue is, you know, what the, the, the place you do, all yeah. of that kind of preparation is a great way of making you feel a little bit more in control because that, that's one of the things we miss. Practice, 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 practice. Um, I practice all the time. You know, I, I don't, yes. I don't go into a training course and wing it. It might sound like it because I try to make my courses informal and fun and energetic, 
But if you come on a social media course and come on the same social media course the following day, it ain't going to be that much different. I'll tweak it for the audience and stuff like that. But, you know, I've I've spent time figuring out how long that I need to talk about this, the right anecdotes and the right analogies Mm -hmm, to use mm -hmm, here. You know, it's it's all practice, practice, practice. And again, with preparation and practice, we, we will be much more confident going into it and things are more likely to hit the beats. And the patience is that if you are new to it, it is going to go wrong. You know, that's, yes, that's the thing. Definitely. Uh, and when we learn any new skill, juggling, for instance, the first time we pick up three oranges, we ain't juggling with three oranges. You know, we learn to toss one to the other, because I, I can juggle, and I learned um, through a television program, I was about 12 up on the telly. One hand to one hand, and then you bring two in, and eventually just looking at people. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. It takes a long, long time to do that. So the bottom line is to have the patience to realise that if it does go wrong, don't worry. My yes. view of failure is the only time you fail is when we fail to learn. And that, that Absolutely. failure, that, that thing, and don't look at it as failure, look as an opportunity to improve. And the thing is, generally, mm-hmm. if you make a little mistake, if your teeth fall out for a moment, or you know, your leg is wobbling, people always go, oh, my knees are shaking so much. No one knows that happened except you. But it is those three P's definitely are great. Mm-hmm. And And the thing is that in the majority of cases, when you are presenting to people, they are there to learn something. They are on your side. In 99.9% of cases, they're there because they want to be, they're there because they want to learn, and your expertise is what they're after. You don't need to be jazz hands, all singing, all dancing. You don't need to be lame. Um, What you need to be is um, you need to know your stuff obviously, which is always mm-hmm. good. Uh, and you need to actually believe in what you're saying. That is the thing that I say. I, I, I honestly Definitely. believe everything that I talk about, everything that I say, very honestly. And there is, if we want to get technical, there is the golden triangle of public speaking, which is set out. Ooh. And it is ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos being the credibility, Absolutely. your experience, you know, whatever that might be. The thing that the, the reason you're there, the pathos is mm-hmm. the passion, the, the love, the desire, the, the interest in what you're talking about. And logos is getting your facts right. And if you have all three of those things Incredible. when you're presenting, that you're credible because of experience or qualification or whatever it might be, that you are passionate about what you do. And again, passion isn't about, yay, it's about that deep-seated belief in what we're talking about. And then the yes. logos, just make sure you've got your facts straight. Uh, and that is how you build Definitely. credibility. I would also watch TED Talks. Mm-hmm. Great one. Yeah, uh, and they're incredible. And there is a wonderful speak. If you are wanting to get into public speaking and you want to get a sense of it, there is a, a great, there are three TED Talks I would recommend, all by the same person. He's a guy called David J.P. Phillips. I think I, I've mentioned him to you. Uh, a Swedish public speaking yes, expert. Yeah. He's got a YouTube channel, so you can go onto his YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, his TED Talks, How to Avoid Death by PowerPoint, which is great. Uh, another one about storytelling. <laughs> and the final one is his 110 skills of public speaking. And his YouTube channel wow. gives tips and hints, but he also analyzes public speakers, and, and it's, that's a great way to learn. My final tip uh-huh. And this is something I get people to do on my courses is I don't know whether you're familiar with the, the Radio 4 program, Just a Minute. No, right. Just a Minute has no. been around. It's in its 80th season. It's been around for like 50, 60 years. Oh, wow. And it started with people like Kenneth Williams and Willie Rushton on it. These kind of and Peter Euston off. Now it's got people like Paul Merton and stuff. Basically, they're given a subject to talk mm-hmm. about, a random subject to talk about for one minute. And they have to do it without hesitating, without repeating themselves and without deviating. And if they hesitate or repeat or deviate, one of the other panelists can buzz in and say, and they then have to try to get to the end of the minute. Whoever gets to the end of the minute wins. Now, what I do with my on my courses, and I still do this myself, is I will give them a subject. I'll give them the weather, food, dogs, okay. cats, whatever it is. And I'll just give them a minute to talk about it. I say, don't worry if you go off piece. Don't worry if it, it, it goes all over the place. Just yes. talk. Uh, and that is a fantastic way of building confidence. It helps you with your improvisation. It gets rid of or can help to get rid of ums and ers and stuff like that. So that's a kind of, every time I say um and er, I tend up, uh, I immediately go, um, um, there you go, did it. Uh, but, you know, that is that kind of thing. So, and I will do that for 10 minutes or 15 minutes sometimes. I'll pick a subject and I'll just talk and talk and talk and talk. I also find it a great way if I'm stuck on something, like I'm, I'm on a PowerPoint presentation or something and I don't know what to say next. I'll just take the thing I'm talking about uh, that I'm stuck on and I'll just randomly wander around the house because I have to move, kinesthetic, uh, just talking and talking and talking. Yes. And it's amazing how once you get into mm-hmm, that stream mm-hmm. of, of unconscious thought where suddenly something will pop up and you go, 
oh, cool, that's a, that's the solution. So that is something that I would I would definitely definitely think about. But yeah, the three P's definitely. But and that golden triangle. If you're credible, if you're passionate, if you know what you're talking about, you're likely to succeed anyway. So um, it doesn't matter. So you don't have, I, as you know, from my style, I, I like to crack jokes. I like the funny stuff. I am perfectly comfortable with making a complete idiot of myself in front of large groups of people. And I personally don't think that there is a fear of public speaking. I don't think people are afraid of public speaking. I think people are afraid of looking foolish in front of a group of people. Absolutely. And if you can get over that, mm -hmm. actually public speaking becomes much simpler. Because if something does go wrong, just laugh it off and crack on. Because I very rarely go through a presentation without at least one thing going wrong. <laughs> in which case, so, oh, teeth, whatever it might be. But, you know, laugh it off and carry on because that's engaging. People actually Absolutely. respond to vulnerability. So if something does go a little bit wrong yes. and you accept it and you with good humor, it's a brilliant way of building rapport with your audience anyway. That is absolutely fantastic. You've given a lot of information there. So oh. thank you, Michael. And yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. People can take it on board and look up the YouTubes and find their way if that's the yep. path they want to go on. So where can the listeners find you online? What's your website? Uh, it is, uh, it's quite a long one, but it's my uh, MN hyphen trainingandmedia.co.uk so mn-trainingandmedia.co.uk or you can find me just by putting Michael Niles into LinkedIn which is where I spend the majority of my time and I'll put the link to your website you. in the show notes so everyone can see it there thank you for sharing your courageous journey with us today and by doing so you have helped so many others Michael Niles thank you very much Denise thank you my final question to you is, what is your definition of courage? Because we are Create the Courage to be Fearless podcasts. So what is your definition of courage? Uh, I have a, quite a long think about this one, actually, because, you know, when you mentioned it to me when we met a couple of weeks ago, there are so many things about courage. I think, you know, because, you know, someone starting a new business, for instance, or, you know, someone doing career mm -hmm. change or whatever it might be, these are courageous things. I, my personal belief in, in courage uh, because it's something that very few of us do is that I think it's simply the ability to say, I need help because yes. we don't do that very often because we feel that we don't want to put that on other people. We feel that it's things that we should deal with ourselves. I've been a victim of that myself over the years, and that can have a very detrimental impact yes. on what you're trying to achieve, but also potentially from a mental health perspective. Yeah, definitely. I, I yeah. So my, my personal view is that the most courageous thing we can ever do is to admit that we need some support, admit that we need some help, and then find the people who can support us, whether it's friends, whether it's family, whether it's colleagues, whether it's organizations, you know, like Winter, for instance, if you're starting up a business in, in our area anyway. I think for me, the most courageous thing we can ever do is to admit that we need support from other people and go out and seek it.